Right, Mr. Palmer here. I'm going to do a second take on this uh, video. Uh, the first one rambling way too much. A bit late. So before you watch this video, make sure you go over your notes on procedural programming. Okay? So you remember what we're talking about when we refer to paradigms and how procedural programming works. What are the advantages and disadvantages of it? All right. So uh, looking in this one uh, at declarative languages and how does a declarative language work? All right. First of all, remember that the development of programming languages in terms of moving towards high level has been removing, increasing the abstractions, removing having to deal with the actual hardware itself. So in the beginning, you had machine code. There's some opcode, an address, and some data hardware specific tied to a particular CPU that then moved into assembler, all right, where you there were there was use of monomics, um, and you know to make it easier to um, do things and then you've got high level languages where it's just like x equals y you're not worried about what's going on at that low level all right so declarative languages are very high level to specify what needs to be done not how at all so some um, people will say that html is a declarative language because it just specifies what data is on the page okay it doesn't say anything about how it should be presented and it leaves that up to other things all right uh, so some declarative languages also um, they involve searching through sets of data all right uh, to achieve a, a goal using what we call predicate logic because it's trying to prove something is either true or false and so you have data sets fact made of facts and rules and then it searches through those trying to achieve trying to find a particular goal achieve a particular goal all right so for example i've got my fact set one on the left hand side there's a list of uh, car dealers um, in different cities and my goal on the right hand side is london x so let's find anywhere any dealer in london all right so it will basically my system will go through the fact set birmingham not in list london Auto House is in List London. Shiny Cars not in List London. Prestige no. Car Giant yes. Lucas not in List London. Auto Trust yes in List London, and I get my result. This is a, a slightly more developed example. Okay, this time I've got uh, two different sets of facts. Okay, and my goal is Micro X London X. So it's going to look in the second fact set first to find examples of data that are in the list micro. And so it immediately finds micro car zone. Then it goes off into fact set two and it's going to look to see if car zone is in the London list. And it can see that it's not. It's in the Birmingham list. And therefore it now needs to backtrack and find uh and start again okay so it will go down that uh, fact list to fact set 2 until it finds micro x again so it's found prestige and then when it looks in fact set 1 it can see that prestige is not on the london list so therefore it now needs to backtrack which means going back up a step okay and then working towards the goal again and so then it finds a uh, car giant as it keeps working its way down that list and then it checks in fact set 2 and it can see that car giant is on the London list and therefore it can return a result um, to say that there's micro at car giant all right so some vocab that I was using there facts are the raw data that's stored in the database okay there are also rules for example you might have a rule like uh, um, uh, if age is greater than 18 then fireworks equals yes because you are allowed to buy fireworks otherwise you're not okay and it can use those rules to help determine whether um, a particular instance that is being returned uh, instance that is found sorry is a valid uh, result uh, towards the goal so the goal obviously is the thing that you're looking for instances are facts that are returned all right that are satisfy the criteria for that goal and backtracking is when you go back up a step um, in your uh, search 
for the goal because you haven't found something that matches the criteria. The advantages of declarative programming basically are that it's extremely abstract. You're uh, you're saying what the program should accomplish in a particular domain. You don't you don't focusing on the processing in any way, shape, or form. So that basically means that non-technical users can understand the system. So the people who know the most about how the system should work are the people who are working in a particular job. And declarative programming allows them to uh, take control of the system. You think about like um, an expert system in a hospital. All right, uh, you want doctors and surgeons to understand what's going on and in, in, in the system to be able to use it and to update it. You know, you don't really want to be handing it over to a programmer who doesn't really know what, you know, the ins and outs of that particular problem domain. Right? The disadvantages of it are that you can't see how the system is implementing a particular query. Uh, you know, you might want to look in, into it in depth and see how the, the joins and the data sets are being linked together. Uh, there's minimal input and output capabilities, just getting less of data, and there's um, generally poor performance in um, some forms of, you know, AI-based uh, languages. They work better on parallel processing systems. Right, so that's uh, the end of this little video again on how does a dec declarative language work. Um, so you should be able to compare it to a procedural language and see the difference in terms of working towards getting the end result out of the program where with a procedural language you have a list of very specific instructions and steps explaining exactly how things should be done whereas a procedural language which is very very high level um, and doesn't really doesn't say anything about how something should be done just says this is the result that I'm looking for can you prove it true or false can you return the correct answer for me right that's that one done and uh, I'm going to try and knock out one more video on object-oriented programming.